Okay, so reading and writing, um, this is a database format, so we've got uh, some sort of ideas here about what you should be doing when you're writing to a database, and I'm going to go through a workspace and show you each of these different um, ideas as we go through them. So we'll talk about having a unique key field and what that might be useful for. Um, with PostGIS, you have the option of uh, how you handle your geometry columns, whether they're going to be ge generic geometry so that you can put lines and points and polygons into the same um, feature class, or like whether you're going cats, to... Like dogs and cats living together? Exactly. Or if you're going to be um, very specific about the type of geometry that's going to be in your uh, PostGIS feature class. So. Which is more, if, if people come from an Esri mindset, it, it's more usual that you have only points hanging out with points and so on. And that's in fact, right. I think some of the different uh, GIS clients that, that, are used, that work with PostGIS are a little happier with you if you use um, only the specific geometries. That's right. And in fact, our um, example going into ArcMap, we had to make sure that they were just actually simple polygons. Right. So post, uh, ArcGIS is quite um, rigid, I rigid guess. about what they use in terms of geometries. So we'll um, have a brief look at the different supported geometries that came in with FME 2013. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about some of the efficiencies of working with uh, databases in terms of transaction size and, and bulk copy and things like that. So I think what I'm going to do is bring up my workspace and then, or bring up a workspace and we can take a look at how all this fits together. So if I open up my FME, my initial dialog looks like this here. So for those of you that have never seen it before, this is the uh, screen that comes up when you start up FME. And I'm just going to show you how we might be in, generating a workspace because some of the settings on the PostGIS writer you have to do it at the time you add the writer into the workspace. Okay. So let's just do a simple generate workspace here and I'm going to read some data from some AutoCAD files. So I have a, a DWG file out here and as I type in the extension or the format that I'm interested in it sort of starts to narrow down the list that's available to me and I'm going to pick my DWG file. And then I'm going to go out there and find where that DWG file is associated. So I click on the file browser here and I can go and find my source data. So I have a, um, what is it, a water distribution network here that I'm going to go and look at. And with drawing files I have the option here to do a bunch of stuff with my uh, source data. So I'm going to bring it in by attribute schema and I'm actually not going to expand my blocks. But every, all these other settings Blocks are just Blocks are point features. Little... So basically you want to get the point features as points. That's right. Yes. Because I didn't really want to worry about blowing them up. Real good. So then I'm going to go and write to my PostGIS. So I've got PostGIS here. I can start typing that word in. And it, again, it narrows down my list. And you'll see I've got Postgres as well. But I'm going to write to PostGIS. That really, the difference is that Postgres wouldn't know what to do with spatial and PostGIS does. And in fact, you know, it's very easy to make a Postgres workspace because yeah. all it'll do, even though this is a drawing file, if there were any attributes associated with any of the features, then it would just write those to my Postgres. So. Right. So in my parameters, always with the database, the primary thing is to figure out how to connect to that database. So I have a parameters tab here in which I can set up my database connections. Now, I noticed that it was all filled in for you. That's sort of magical, but I suspect, and most, if you're not doing this and you're using FME with a database, I recommend that defaults button at the bottom. Robin must have saved this as your defaults at some time in the past. I did, because there's nothing worse than getting the password wrong five times when you're Especially trying to do a webinar. Especially doing the webinar. Yes, but fill that in uh, is definitely a good, a good tip. But what I wanted to show you, which is the most important thing about this dialogue for PostGIS, yeah. are these last two columns uh, because, or, or options. Because if you don't select them now, you can't change them after the fact. Okay. So the, the top one is about whether or not I want to create generic spatial columns. And if I click that, it means that my feature classes can contain any kind of geometry. If I don't click it, then I will have to select the geometry on each of the feature classes. Right. So if you if you're working in an Esri kind of environment, you would leave that unchecked. That's because right. Because you want the, the you want FME to force you into saying, well, these are lines, these are points. If you check that, then you can let everybody live together and like map info or I think GeoMedia right. might be a bit like that too. That's right. So that's but if you don't do it at the time that you add your writer. You're, you're sort of sunk, okay. so you have to do it at that time. Right. And then the other thing is the lowercase attribute names. Now, uh, PostGIS is very, very much a lowercase um, 
tool or product or whatever you might call it. So everything, it expects everything to have lowercase. And so if you, if you check that box, then you'll be in conformance with PostGIS. But many of the other formats, of course, have mixed case attribute names and table names or uppercase attributes and table names. And you can certainly put these into your PostGIS, but you run into issues when you're working with it in that everything has to be quoted to make it all work. And so if you're used to working with lowercase, then you might want to make sure that your attribute names are lowercase. Yes. And in fact, in my testing yesterday, I found this was something I needed to do again to get it to work with ArcMap. Oh. ArcMap was not happy with mixed case table names and attribute names. Right. So that's that's this case issue in databases is one that kind of plagues us because different other systems may or may not support it. So even if we do, it doesn't guarantee that the others will. That's right. So we have to use some caution around this issue. Yeah, and so we'll be looking at that in my next workspace as well. So by once I've selected the way I want this to look, I can click OK, click OK again, and it will build me a translation. So it tells me that in my drawing file I had three different feature types and I want to work with them all. I can click OK and it builds me a, a translation. So now if I open these up, this is my source here, my source coming from the water meters and going into a water meters table in my destination. And you'll notice here that the geometry, I, un, I left the generic columns box unchecked. So it's forcing me to use a particular geometry. If you scroll that up and down, so okay. these are all the types of geometries that we support within PostGIS. Now we should ask Paul, and he can chime in, but the one below that says PostGIS geometry, I think that lets you put anything you want in there. It probably does as well. Well, we'll ask Paul. So that would be a way, if you change your mind and you do want to put lines and points in the same one, you can make the table say PostGIS geometry, and now anything can live in there. Good. See, we all learn something when you come to Paul will verify that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to ask him to... Uh, message me but that's uh, I think uh, I think you're right actually. one of the customers Sean was asking that exact thing and I think that would be the answer there Sean yes so you'll notice that it by default it told me that these were going to be multi points but I don't actually want them to be multi points I might want them just to be simple points so I can change that geometry to right. whatever I know is coming through into here so that's the um, that's the full list of the supported geometries. Many of these are new to FME 2013 so things like compound curves and curved polygons and what have you, polyhedral surfaces, my goodness. There's so, a mouthful. Yes, exactly. So all of these things are new to 2013 and uh, available to you in the allowed geometry section there. Ah, one other customer asked, is, is geography listed in there? Do you see that anywhere? That's okay. actually, interestingly enough, and I've got an example showing how we're going to write okay. to geography, is in our formats parameters over here. So in the formats parameters, I can tell it that the spatial column ah, type is going to be it, geometry right, okay. So or that's geography. Orth really, that's orthogonal to the type. So in other words, yes. it's not, you can have lines that are either geography or geometry. Yes. And for those that don't know, this is a couple of the databases, SQL Server and PostGIS, maybe Oracle, have, um, the, have the concept of being able to tell the database, hey, this stuff is that long, and so a whole new different kind of math applies. That's right. I think Oracle will hold stuff that's in a lat long projection, but it doesn't it doesn't right. work with it like geography. Sure, because geography. When, when you say that it's geography, then things like buffer mean different things. And, yes. you, and you don't have a rip at the rip in the space time continuum at the date line and, exactly. and at the poles and stuff. Yes. So, so these are the things that are really high end things. That's right. And so post just is one of the probably not even well, was one of the early adapters of that. And so it has this option of uh, of using a spatial type of geography. And of course, you can then name your spatial column whatever you want. You could call it location, right. you could call it geography, whatever works in your environment. So that's um, completely independent of anything else. Right. Uh, the next option here is your SRID. So you, if you know what the SRID of your data is, so for instance, if I'm actually going to use um, geometry here and it's in a projection that I know of, I might want to put that uh, EPSG number in here, so I could put that in there, and then it will take that and add it to every one of the features as it's writing them out. Right, but I think if you leave that blank and we and we know the coordinate system, FME will do its job of guessing that. That's right. So, so you don't have to fill it in, but sometimes your source data may not know what yes. what it's um, in, and so then you could uh, tell it here. Or if there's a little bit of DBA in you, you want to have full control and be explicit, yes. then uh, then you might want to put that in. But otherwise, we will do our best job of mess of mapping that up. 
that's right. So a couple of the other interesting settings in here is um, are we going to, does this table already exist? Yes. So do we want to drop it before we write a new one? Or do we just want to empty it out and uh, write it back into it again? Keep so we have a, a couple of options here for working with the tables. Um, if you truncate the table, you can't recreate it with, or you can't add new at columns to it. So dropping a table allows you to rebuild it with a different structure to what it used to have. Right. Yep. So a couple more that are just post just specific is to create it with OIDs, which are um, sort of a random number, a uniquely Free. unique to each fe feature. So you okay. can set that up to either yes or no, depends on what you want to do. Um, creating an Index is always a good idea if it's spatial data because you want to have it indexed so that you can uh, do spatial relationships against it. I thought that was a GST index from here. My eyes are failing me. Canadians, <laughs> the Canadians won't like that. In BC, it would have been an HST index, but we got rid of That's that. That's right, but no special taxes on your uh, feature types. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and then the uh, last option, of course, here is to uh, vacuum analyze your table, which is something that Post just likes you to do, or Postgres actually likes you to do in terms of cleaning up your tables. It sounds painful. <laughs> yeah, so, but it gets rid of all that blank space between your records. Right. You know what? I think one customer was asking about the user attributes tab. Do you want to just say a couple words about what goes on in there? Sure. Um, the last one, oh, of yes. course, is serial columns. So this is if you've got one of those columns that I think in PostGIS it's called a serial, oh. and SQL Server is called an identity. And auto increment things. And it auto increments. So ah. you can uh, set your feature type up to do that sort of thing. Okay. Yep, so that's pretty much the parameters that are associated with each table in your writer. So you'll notice here in my workspace yes. I have three of them and I can set these individually for each one of these three feature right. classes. The user attributes on the other hand are the attributes that I might want to save from the information that's coming in. Now on my source data here for water meters there were no yes. attributes so there's nothing in here. So let's go and just take a look and see if we can find one that actually did have user attributes. Yeah, there we go. So here it's bought from my source the attributes that were on my source and is taking them into my destination here. And the two that it picked up were feature ID and a particular tile. Yeah. Now I discovered that on the source they were both bar charts. If they had been numeric, it might have picked a different data type. Yes. And in here is the list of all the available data types to me. Wow. So okay. you'll notice again those are all PostGIS data types. Um, it's probably similar to the PostGRES list, yes. but they'll be completely different to the list you might find in Oracle or SQL Server or GML or Shape or any one of those. I like formats. that there's money. <laughs> yes, that's pretty cute, huh? Yeah. But possibly that means that's a number with the two decimal place. I doubt that it actually has a dollar symbol on it. But it does allow you to do things like timestamping, um, create UUID fields. The serial is in there too. And your serial type, that's right. So if you want to control the writing of the serial, you can use that serial bar, uh, data right. type. So this lets you basically design, if you were starting from scratch, this is where you'd create the table effectively. So you don't need to go and use a SQL statement to do create table outside of here. So this would be where those that hate SQL can kind of accomplish table creation without ever knowing how to spell create. That's right, exactly. And with my, with my level of SQL, sometimes I can never remember where to put the commas and the brackets and you know the syntax is so picky. So this is a great way to create a table and if I wanted to add additional value, well let's go on to our next workspace before yes. I preempt myself. So are you going to so, run this thing? No, you know what, I'm not going to run okay. it because I'm going to show you, um, well we can, no, I'm no gonna it's okay, I'm, I'm teasing you. Yeah. <laughs> so because I think you've Dale got... promised he wouldn't off-road me and now there he goes before yeah. we've even got started. So let me open up uh, one of my workspaces where we we're doing some interesting stuff here. This one's not interesting enough to run. Nah, we got all kinds of stuff in this next one. Okay. Okay. Zoom her up a bit. Let's zoom in here a bit. Yeah. I need to perhaps get rid of a bit more. Give myself a bit more screen space. Okay, so this is basically that same example, but here where uh, what I've done is used an entity ID to be my unique field in my post just and so here uh, I also um, have set my output such that it will uh, drop the table first because I was practicing this yesterday of course and so I've probably got tables in there. So we will run this example here and we'll just take a look at what happens when we do run it and you'll notice that down the bottom here I have a log window which shows me what's going on and so it wow. will tell me how many features I've read and how many features I've written and where they've come from and things like that. So 
here I've got order lines, order meters, and order nodes, and they'll have been written into my PostGIS database. Now, I also noticed that inside of your workspace after you were done, those lines were labeled with those same kind of numbers. Exactly. So it's telling me which which feature class is writing to which feature class and how many features are going through into them. 